Okay, thank you for waiting. Uh, I only have 20 slides. I hope I, I get through to it before uh, wine and cheese starts. Uh, I will be speaking on the history of the inner core recorded by seismology, but uh, uh, many of the observations we see in seismology are, uh, in order to understand them, are very multidisciplinary, requiring both the inputs of geochemistry and geodynamics, geomagnetics. Uh, inner core history observed from seismology indicates Recent interpretations indicate both freezing and melting possibly occurring simultaneously, uh, evidence of differential rotation. And in this regard, the inner core uh, is historical record records not just snapshots, but actually a movie with differential rotation in that uh, differences in uh, observables occur over fairly short periods of time on the order of decades. Uh, Outline of the uh, talk will briefly summarize radially uh, symmetric or vertical structure uh, through the inner core, describe what the F layer is. Again, this comes from Bullen's nomenclature of regions of the Earth, A, B, C, D, E, F. This is the region just above the inner core boundary. Uh, describe evidence for uh, inner core boundary topography, which will pose a uh, geodynamic challenge to describe the heights and scale lengths of topography that we see from seismology. Uh, summarize uh, large and small scale lateral heterogeneity and uh, a very uh, interesting mystery to understand is the one deg uh, degree one or hemispherical structure of the inner core that's now uh, reasonably well accepted from seismic uh, observations. And then also uh, describe small scale heterogeneity which will become very important for understanding uh, free regions of freezing and melting of the inner core boundary from the outer core and provide very important constraints on attenuation, scattering, and elastic uh, anisotropy and attenuation anisotropy. So already you can see the inner core is quite structurally complicated as been mentioned uh, earlier today. And all of these can be used for finding uh, 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 regions which may be freezing, melting, and also place some uh, uh, better constraints or understanding on differential inner core rotation where the inner core may be rotating at, at a different rate with respect to the mantle. Uh, well, uh, in this slide, I just try to emphasize the importance of the solidification for the, of the inner core to, as a mechanism for driving the so-called compositional dynamo, where the inner core is uh, freezing into a uh, pure uh, iron in some uh, unknown uh, crystalline lattice uh, structure, although hexagonal close pack is beginning to be a little bit more favored. I do not necessarily uh, favor sulfur as the light element uh, could be uh, uh, silicon or oxygen or any number of lighter elements. Uh, but this, uh, uh, by showing uh, a, a phase diagram for FES, emphasizing the importance uh, in input to the unknown phase diagram for the solidifying iron alloy inner core. We really don't know what this looks like at the temperature or pressures of the inner core, nor do we have a complete understanding of what this light element might be, which will be important for controlling controlling velocity variations, elastic velocity uh, variations in the inner core. For example, the light element may uh, preferentially partition into uh, uh, colder regions of the inner core compared to uh, warmer regions relative to the melting temperature. Uh, and again, the importance of this uh, compositional uh, dynamo is that it provides a mechanism for stirring uh, the outer core and uh, 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 making the convection that uh, drives the geodynamo through motion of the metallic uh, alloy of the outer core. Uh, much we do not understand about the inner core solidification process, including very fundamental questions such as, is the inner core growing by snowing from above? As in this uh, diagram we, uh, from an old uh, uh, cider meeting uh, with a group with uh, uh, Jackie Lee. Uh, or is it growing from below, perhaps uh, giving rise to a texture that looks like this? This is a slide from Mike Bergman, the equatorial cross-section and a polar cross-section. And this type of texture will control the nature of elastic anisotropy as well as uh, scattering attenuation. This type of texture indicating large boundaries, uh, regions of similar oriented grains, uh, is similar to the kind of texture you would see in a Goleta lemon, for example. Uh, just a quick overview of seismic body wave observations that what we look at uh, to determine inner core structure. 
emphasizing that the inner core is a relatively small target. It's smaller than the size of your fist in a 12-inch globe. And as such, it's very difficult to get an even sampling throughout its structure and to, to investigate lateral variations. I won't review seismic uh, nomenclature here. Uh, but just to emphasize, we can sample the inner core from a variety of different angles, which becomes very important for understanding its texture and uh, nature of anisotropy. And uh, one phase I'll emphasize early on is this wave that kind of leaks around the edge of the inner core called PKPC diffracted. It's a wave, frequency dependent wave that leaks around the top of the inner core. And, uh, we seek to match the frequency content and the amplitude of this little wave here in this distance range around 150 degrees and greater. Uh, also, we can measure differential travel times of waves that sample the upper inner core and lower inner core, and this provides constraints on inner core uh, velocity depth structure. Uh, this is uh, Bullen's F region. Again, this is a nomenclature dividing the Earth into regions A, B, C, D, E, F. Uh, this is the region of Bullen's uh, core, uh, Earth model just above the inner core boundary. Here's the boundary between the solid and liquid. The radius of the inner core is about uh, 1,200 kilometers. And what we see with fitting travel times, global travel times, as well as differential travel times, and the travel time of the wave diffracted around the edge of the inner core is that there's a, uh, the, the gradient of P velocity gradient flattens out and we get uh, in the region just above the inner core boundary. And perhaps this could be explained by an iron enrichment in this layer, uh, consistent with uh, solidifying boundary, making a, a, more, a more or less stagnant iron negative, uh, uh, layer that does not mix into the rest of the outer core so well, with perhaps lighter element plumes somehow percolating through it. Uh, so the simplest explanation of the F region would be an iron enriched layer near the inner core region that's either solidifying or melting. Um, this uh, single slide emphasizes uh, our, our most recent study on inner core hemispherical structure. Um, there is about a half dozen or more of these types of studies that are kind of uh, confirm each other. Uh, our particular study uh, de de deconvolved the source time function of earthquakes, so, which enabled us to measure differential travel times a little bit more accurately, we thought. And in this slide, I just want to emphasize the blue means fast and the red means slow. Uh, when we say the hemispherical structure of the inner core in the eastern hemisphere and western hemisphere follows pretty much our, our notion of eastern and western hemisphere divided by the Greenwich meridian and the dateline, although we, uh, to be a little bit more precise, we often call it the quasi-hemispheres. So the western, uh, eastern hemisphere is fast, the western hemisphere is slow in the inner core, and these differences persist at least down to 250 kilometers below the inner core boundary. And here's a deeper inner core showing that the hemispherical differences or degree one differences persist to great depth. And if the inner core is differentially rotating, this becomes a challenge to explain how do we maintain these hemispherical differences if the inner core is rotating at different rates with respect to the mantle and the processes of solidification may differ laterally as it's rotating. This hemispherical structure would be progressively erased unless this differential rotation is not uh, steady, but rather some kind of wobble, uh, both uh, super rotation and then uh, prograde rotation and retrograde rotation. The type of signal that's looked at by seismologists to observe this phenomena is uh, illustrated in this slide here, uh, where we look at so-called earthquake doublets, earthquakes that occur almost in the same region, maybe not exactly the same region, but within a tenths of a wavelength away, maybe 10 or 20 kilometers away from another, nearly identical in source time function at the same location. And when we observe those over two periods of time, maybe a decade or so apart, we see that the seismograms match for the two earthquakes, wiggle for wiggle, everywhere else in the coat of all the different complex scattered waves and core waves. But in the branch of wave that's transmitted through the inner core, there's a little bit of a time shift indicating that different regions of the inner core are sampled over the two observations that are perhaps a decade apart. Uh, this is a very uh, controversial type of measurement that's been done by several groups. Uh, and uh, uh, get, sometimes often getting different results depending on uh, starting assumptions about heterogeneity within the inner core 
And one controversy has been that normal mode observations, at least one study, indicates a near uh, zero differential rotation rate uh, in a time period spanning uh, 1980 to about year 2000. Body waves indicate a more steady signal, but at least one study done recently by Tikalchik and Sandbridge indicates that the rotation is not steady, but it's punctuated by regions of prograde rotation and actually uh, retrograde rotations indicated by red, but depending on how you average it over time, it look, may look like a near zero signal. They also have a controversial interpretation that some of these prograde impulses may be correlated with magnetic jerks in some unknown fashion. So there's a lot of interdisciplinary uh, work that could be done on understanding these inner core uh, uh, variations in time. Now this is a study of inner core topography and rather than focusing your attention on the upper part of this slide, focus your attention on this lower part which is a measure of topography. Now the units here aren't quite right to interpret well but the length of this topographic uh, bump over here is over five to seven kilometers high and the wavelength or the lateral length here width of this bump is about 30 to 50 kilometers, recent study by Day and others in uh, proceedings in National Academy. Uh, this is the data which they're trying to match some precursors, something that comes in before the main transmitted inner core uh, wave, as well as the amplitude of the, these different wave types. And it could be explained by this type of topography. And I should mention that we, re, uh, by virtue of a, a collaboration initiated at the last CIDR with uh, John Hernland, we're trying to model inner core topography. We have a C-City project uh, funded out of the results of that conversation. And John is trying to uh, estimate dynamically the type of topography that would exist on the inner core boundary. And so far, most geodynamicists uh, find it very difficult to uh, predict uh, topography that's five uh, over five kilometers high. They like one kilometer or more. So it will become a challenge, a geodynamic challenge, to explain how does topography this high get on the inner core? And this is not the only type of uh, seismic observation that's uh, consistent with topography. The amplitude of waves transmitted down nearly vertically uh, and reflected by the inner core also it suggests topography of this order in order to explain the amplitude distance variation of the topography. And indeed, uh, Barbara was uh, a co-author of one of those studies that also indicated uh, fairly high topography a few years ago. Uh, next, I'm going to summarize some results on inner core attenuation. And by attenuation, we mean the, uh, the amplitude distance decay of different seismic waves and also their frequency content. There will be several uh, reviews, or at least one review later in the week, about uh, attenuation measurements. Basically, what we try to do in seismology is match the amplitudes and frequency contents of different waves. And this is the wave that's transmitted through the inner core versus one that misses the inner core. And clearly, you can see the lower frequency content relative to the one that misses the inner core. In our studies, we uh, a common way of approaching uh, measuring attenuation is to uh, compare two different uh, waves, one that misses the inner core, one that goes through it. But rather than compare them, we uh, choose instead to directly uh, model the complete waveform. In other words, get the shape of this exactly right, both its frequency content and any phase velocity dispersion that may exist in this pulse. In order to do that, we have to first invert and know very carefully what uh, the shape of the initial uh, earthquake uh, wave was, the source time function. So we first model the source time function at a different distance range, including its azimuthal variations. Uh, that will include an, uh, some scatter due to assumption of an average mantle attenuation effect. And the remaining amplitude and frequency content will just be an effect of inner core attenuation. And this slide here just illustrates uh, values of two parameters in an attenuation model, uh, one parameter and another parameter, inverse Q and uh, on a corner of a relaxation spectrum where a Q becomes frequency uh, dependent, two parameter attenuation model. And it illustrates that this type of inversion is very nonlinear. Uh, uh, linearizing about any one of these values would uh, descend into a, a bad minimum. It's a very nonlinear inverse problem, and quite often you get a topography of the most likely value that looks like this. Uh, this uh, study we did back in about 2002 or so. Uh, of that type of matching waveforms, no longer any reference phase uh, for a 
uh, to compare for inner core attenuation. So without the, Without the need of a reference phase, we're able to penetrate an inner core attenuation map down to its center, starting from its surface down to its center. So we can look at the difference in attenuation very deep versus very shallow in the inner core. This is uh, radius into the inner core, top of the inner core, bottom of the inner core. This is orientation with of the uh, array of the wave with respect to the rotational axis. So, so we plotted against the rotational axis to see if we can observe any attenuation anisotropy. There's a suggestion of a little bit more attenuation in our study as you approach the polar axis, which several other studies uh, uh, seem to confirm. But most importantly, we see a, uh, a very dramatic drop off in attenuation about halfway to its center. And we take this as our another independent evidence of the existence of an inner inner core or an innermost inner core as uh, Javonsky and, uh, or Ishii and Javonsky first uh, suggested. Uh, their inner inner core was 300 kilometers radius. Our inner inner core, we prefer something, a transition more halfway to its center, five or 600 kilometer radius. And this uh, would rec possibly record a history of something different about inner core solidification happening about 500 million years ago. So in this regard, seismology may record an important event uh, in Earth history uh, some difference about the solidification of the inner core, heat transport across its boundary about 500 million years ago, assuming a growth rate on the order of millimeter or two per year. Uh, uh, we've re uh, inverted uh, for attenuation both using a viscoelastic model and a scattering model. In other words, two ways you can attenuate seismic waves, either internal friction, uh, kind of a microscopic mechanism, uh, uh, much like uh, uh, grain boundaries uh, behaving like uh, viscous dash pots or, or dislocations, or uh, a completely different mechanism known as scattering, where frequencies, uh, higher frequencies are stripped out of the waveform by scattering off in different directions. And we've looked at inner core attenuation in both of these different ways, both scattering and viscoelasticity. In this particular inversion, we plot scale length in a scattering model. Uh, versus, uh, again, radius, versus orientation with respect to the pole. Uh, we f and then uh, we find that uh, scale lengths on the or four, or several hundred meters at the top of the inner core in a scattering model of attenuation, uh, increasing from several hundred meters up to about uh, 10 kilometers or so deeper in the inner core. Uh, similar results have been obtained by a completely different method by Kelvay and others, indicating in a scattering model scale lengths on the order of hundreds of meters at the top of the inner core. What these scatterers are, we don't know yet. They could be two different ideas. You could have uh, intrinsically anisotropic crystals against each other, where the boundary between the two crystals performs the scattering boundary, or patches of them, organized patches, that's the Kelvay model. Or you can have uh, uh, pockets or partial melt maybe distributed along uh, edges of patches. So this could be uh, indicating of scattering by either partial melt or disorganized anisotropic uh, crystals, two different ideas. Another way you can get at the texture of the inner core, important both for freezing and melting hypotheses, are from waves that are backscattered uh, from the inner core boundary. This is the wave that comes down nearly vertically to the inner core and bounces back up. Uh, this is uh, time in seconds along here. If, this, if there were no scattering, this would just be a simple pulse isolated uh, within a couple seconds or so based on the uh, magnitude six type earthquake source time function. Uh, but instead we see an extended coda uh, that of, of scattered waves. This is the envelope, so-called coda envelope, that you can try to match with different textures of backscattered waves. We use something called the radiative transport method to predict that scattering. Radiative transport method basically consists of uh, taking the radiation pattern of an earthquake and dividing that up into little quanta uh, of energy going in different directions. And then uh, that quanta has taken out a mean free path Governed, the mean free path is governed by the statistics of the heterogeneity. And then uh, once you reach that mean free path, you flip a coin, sample a probability distribution to figure out which direction the wave goes next. And then we collect those little uh, quanta of energy in different bins of space and time to model the coda. 
Uh, the bottom line here is that this type of texture, which we call an isotropic type, uh, type sketcher with, uh, texture with scale lengths about equal in every direction, will match the coda uh, that is best sampled beneath uh, the Western Hemisphere. This type of texture may be consistent with vertical dendrites, produces very uh, little texture, and uh, this one is a little bit too short, horizontally stretched. But this type of texture may exist where we do not see a strong coda indicating the presence of vertical dendrites. Another possibility of no coda, of course, is no texture at all. So those are kind of two end members to think about where we see no scattered waves, either a texture like this or a completely uniform no texture. Uh, but this type of isotropic texture seems to be dominant in the places where it can be well sampled to explain the shape of the coda. Uh, excuse me, another observation that uh, important from seismology that can constrain intercore structure uh, are uh, trying to match details of waveforms uh, transmitted and reflected at near grazing incidents at the intercore boundary. And occasionally you can see little perturbations in the waveform that are spatially coherent both in space and are independent of the nature of the earthquake source. And this is one study we did that seemed to find that concentrated in the eastern equatorial hemisphere. And we actually tried to construct a laterally varying uh, region of a, of a thinner layer at the top of the inner core that, uh, has, uh, that has both lateral gradients and vertical gradients away from the eastern equatorial hemisphere. And perhaps uh, this could be a region of either freezing or melting uh, to describe this uh, slightly lower velocity region there. So uh, to summarize, uh, uh, three very, or four di completely different kinds of observations of the inner core uh, that indicate degree one or hemispherical differences. We just looked at this one indicating the existence of a, of a thin region that may induce some multi-paths and waves uh, the, uh, that has a a thinning uh, as you get away from the equator and to the northern, uh, north and south in the eastern hemisphere. Uh, we see uh, this is a summary from a paper by Leighton and Coper indicating stronger coda and backscattered waves in uh, at least the Pacific region uh, or near, uh, you see a gradient near the boundary between uh, what we're calling the eastern and western quasi hemispheres where the scattering properties change. And finally, the gross differences between velocity and attenuation where the eastern hemisphere uh, has uh, higher attenuation, low Q, and is fast, and the western hemisphere uh, uh, higher, um, uh, lower attenuation and slow. Uh, this type of correlation, anti correlation of attenuation and velocity is opposite to what we're used to in the mantle. And, there, and there's a, a real need to understand why do we see this opposite correlation of attenuation and velocity that we're used to in the mantle. It might simply do the fact that we're not, as seismologists, we're not used to interrogating metals, uh, the properties of metals. And we're used to uh, looking at silicates. That might, might be part of the answer. And then finally, we see a prediction of uh, geodynamo prediction by Aubert and, and his coworkers predicting what the, where the, a growing region of the inner core would be. That's the red uh, regions that are not growing were in blue. Uh, these kinds of predictions are governed by uh, taking a heat flow, uh, laterally varying heat flow at the core mantle boundary. So not at the inner core boundary, but high up at the outer core boundary and predicting what the flow might be, be like at the inner core boundary using a numerical dynamo and I'll bear uh, Aubert's prediction for the region that's growing. Uh, spatially, uh, we see a lot of correlations between these three different types of variations. So our, our initial uh, thought about this was that our little, little anomalous region in the equatorial eastern hemisphere could be a growing region, uh, and uh, the region in the western hemisphere, uh, well, we're not sure what it might be. It might be a melting region. But this uh, idea of growing and melting of the inner core, actually we need, the melting is a simple idea to make this F region with the enriched iron uh, uh, exist over long periods of time. So we need to explain why do we have these uh, east-west hemispherical degree one uh, differences in the inner core. This model uh, is by uh, Monero and uh, coworkers and also Albusier and coworkers have uh, a similar uh, papers on this mechanism. It's called the translating convecting inner core. 
uh, where the eastern hemisphere is melting and the western hemisphere is crystallizing. Uh, how this is initiated basically would be due to a degree one difference in heat transport, maybe initiated higher up at the core mantle boundary, uh, which would induce some density differences and some translation of the inner core to uh, uh, consistent uh, with the effects of gravity, uh, but gravity also would act isostatically to make the uh, the melting side uh, transfer uh, liquid iron to the to the freezing side, so there would be an F region that's uniform throughout the inner core. And also, there's some stories about anisotropy with larger crystal sizes in the east, consisting uh, consistent with little elastic anisotropy and smaller grain sizes, consistent with uh, observation of elastic anisotropy in the west. This particular model requires a super adiabatic temperature gradient in the inner core. Uh, and a very restrictive zone of viscosity in order to explain the existence of an innermost inner core and an inner inner core of different texture and possibly different composition. So a very restrictive parameter regime is needed to explain this. Uh, and here's a, an alternative model of freezing and melting of the inner core. Remember that the inner core is primarily freezing. There's a, a net uh, excess of freezing over melting. Uh, but probably both are occurring. Uh, this is a, comes from a similar idea of Aubert's. This particular one, study is by Govins and others, where they take the, the heat um, transport at the core mantle boundary. This is the CMB boundary, core mantle boundary, and try to predict what the heat transport would be at the inner core boundary, similar to Aubert, but with some different assumptions. You see, uh, they get a degree two pattern. Uh, again, the, the heat flow from the core mantle boundary is inferred from seismic tomography. Uh, and this is a cross section of where they predict downwelling and upwelling. The downwelling, narrow downwelling regions would be regions of freezing, uh, cold uh, inner core boundary, and the broad upwelling would be regions of melting. So they would predict uh, kind of a degree two structure of freezing and melting. The freezing region agrees with the Obear study. Uh, but not so much in the degree, uh, in that there's a more of a degree two pattern here than a degree one. However, if they, they say if they average this picture over several magnetic diffusion times, this uh, spot here in the eastern hemisphere, the freezing part gets uh, more prominent compared to that region. Uh, here's another relevant idea, predicting what heat flow near the inner core boundary. Uh, this study by Calkins and others Showing the effect, this was a study of topography at the core mantle boundary. What might it do to flow in a highly turbulent uh, dynamo? Uh, the major difference between Calkins and the other dynamo type of studies is this is a, a two-dimensional flow model, not a three-dimensional one. And with two dimensions, they're able to get into the regime of very low viscosity, low Ekman number that may be closer to outer core, liquid outer core conditions. The important uh, bottom line in this slide uh, these, uh, is this uh, part portion here, convective heat flux near the inner core boundary. This is the region of topography on the, on the uh, core mantle boundary. As they find, uh, predict very strongly enhanced regions of positive and negative fl heat flow at the inner core boundary, which are enhanced by a factor of two with topography that's only on the order of two kilometers, similar to the type of topography that's been uh, uh, inverted for, from seismologists and uh, geodynamicists uh, for the inner core, bound, uh, outer core mantle boundary. So topography on the outer core boundary as well as topography of the inner core boundary combined are very important for understanding the nature of freezing and melting at the inner core. Uh, summary conclusions, there are at least two transitions in inner core texture, a deep one about halfway to the center of an, uh, indicating a boundary between an inner inner core, uh, perhaps uh, indicating a major transition about 500 million years ago. Uh, my student and I uh, favor uh, uh, this uh, transition maybe due to the fact that uh, there is a stability of, of heat flow uh, due to configurations of continents going back 500 million years ago, at least in the East Asian region. Uh, where the subduction has been uh, occurring, uh, occurring uh, uh, in a similar, uh, spatially similar region in East Asia for at least 500 million years, uh, cooling that part of the eastern uh, equatorial hemisphere. A shallow uh, transition that may be due to variations in freezing and melting 
concentrated in the equatorial regions. Lateral variations are both large and small. The hemispherical one, we've talked about degree one, and small scale structure needed to explain uh, variations and scattering related to freezing and melting. There are two scenarios to explain these uh, lateral variations. Both of them require lateral variations and in inter inner core heat flux, and but the predicted locations of freezing and melting are reversed. And perhaps this could be used to determine which hypothesis is uh, the correct one. Uh, one hypothesis predicts freezing in the east and the melting in the west. And this is consistent with a dominant viscoelastic attenuation or intrinsic attenuation in the east, but scattering, attenua uh, uh, I meant scattering attenuation in the west. Uh, the opposite hypothesis, this is the uh, 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 translating convecting hypothesis, melting in the east and freezing in the west uh, this is consistent with textural models with anisotropy and scattering attenuation, but uh, both of these hypotheses have some holes and problems that could be solved if we understood the texture of the inner core better. What does the texture of a metal look like as it freezes or melted, uh, melting? And, that, and some contribution from geodynamicists and mineral physics would help greatly in a help, uh, seismology understanding that. There is inner core topography with fairly high heights, uh, maybe up to seven kilometers, uh, wavelengths of the are 50 or 100 kilometers. Very difficult to explain this geodynamically. Perhaps it's related to quasi-stationary cyclones in the outer core due to core mantle topography, enhanced heat flow as proposed by Calkins. And then finally, uh, another uh, topography-related conclusions is that it can explain uh, the amplitudes of core-reflected uh, P waves and it's an alternative to laterally varying tiles of impedance uh, to have topography as well as the attenuation of the wave that's diffracted along the inner core boundary. So I hope I've inspired some uh, multidisciplinary discussions in the inner core to group for some different problems to work on. Yes. All right. A question? Okay. I'm wondering if the gravity center of the inner core are the same as the center of the Earth. Is the what detected? I mean, the center of the inner core? If, yeah. If it's growing on one side and the melting in one side, in the other side, I mean, the center will be eccentric from the center of the Earth. Well, yeah, that's never uh, displaced very far. My understanding, as it's uh, as it's freezing on one side, melting on the other side, the, uh, the, there's a convecting solid that kind of redistributes mass. So that's never the uh, geocentric center or center of mass never is displaced more than a less than a kilometer or two in the whole process, if at all. So it's kind of a equilibrium. Equi it's a process in equilibrium where it's never off, really off center, but it's it's translating as it's deforming. I think it's just crystallization. I don't it's know what you mean. Yeah. Uh, what are you thinking of? Well, it can be, I don't know, metal not in the, not in the crystalline state. Oh, okay, yeah, for example, yeah, the one possibility is it could be a, a glassy state, for example. Yeah, that's a possibility. So it, all of these states are understood? Under yeah, a glassy state with no uh, crystals, but extremely high viscosity, so it effectively behaves like a, it, has, it starts to have a shear modulus, so that's a possibility. Yeah, the 10-kilometer scales come from these backscattered waves. 
I have no knowledge of those particular models, but uh, uh, again, understanding that the, the how, uh, what kind of texture is formed in a metal during freezing or during solid and what kind of scale lengths we, uh, uh, we'd expect uh, in freezing or melting would help a lot and how it's distributed. I have a comment on this. This, this is not a done deal. This is one study. One mm -hmm. study we had less than a kilometer, like 500 meters topography. Yeah, I remember that. I looked at, yeah, I looked at that study and worried whether you guys use ray theory or not to do it. Okay. Mike. You attributed the attenuation with depth to scattering, and you mentioned that you can also have intrinsic attenuation to viscoelastic elasticity. It's probably a combination of both. What's the implied viscosity of this viscoelasticity? Uh, How low that it's unreasonable? It's, it's much lower than, uh, than the translating convecting one. I, I don't remember the number. The translating convecting viscosity, 10 to the 18th, 10 to the 20th. But to get attenuation, we've got to be like 10 to 11, 10 to the 12, something like that. In SI units, Pascal seconds. Yeah, Pascal seconds, yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Well, last, one last question, real quick, hopefully. Oh, yeah. I'm wondering why the location of the Earth uh, is considered one, considering the inner core geography. Because to me, uh, if the center of the inner core is different from the Earth, mm -hmm. and then there will be uh, eccentric faults applied to the inner core, right? Mm -hmm. but, but because it's in the inner core, then the other mass of the Earth doesn't work mm -hmm. as gravity to that. So it's not balanced by the gravity. Oh, no, I, I agree. I think the people that proposed that, the, the Monroe et al. papers, have a detailed explanation of how they get. The topography, the very hemispherical difference is very low, but I forgot the exact number. I think it's less than a kilometer or so. And it's kind of continuously redistributing mass so it maintains the sphericity and the, the center of mass is never displaced very far from the uh, initial center, but I forgot the exact numbers. <laughs>